What I'm going to do is to take you through some pictures and I'm going to say little bits about them and sometimes stop and tell a story. But I'm actually much more interested in your asking me things because to encapsulate 72 years of me and 40 years of Daskar in 20 minutes is a bit of a... So, okay, I work with craftspeople and I've been doing that now for 45 years. So what took me from a snooty, English-speaking Wellamite to a crafty lady? And that's actually the story and that's also the story of Daskar. I was, um, I studied art in, fa in Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda and then I went to Japan and I came back to India thinking that I was going to be an artist with a capital A. But I also had, and this was 1965, so it was rather unusual for the time, I had some rather bold ideas about wanting to earn my own living and not live off my parents and of being independent. So they came the question of paying the rent for my little Bursati in defense colony and of bread and butter, and particularly since I always love to entertain. So I started taking design assignments and in those days design was a very fluid word because NID had not yet sort of taken hold of this word and taken possession of it. So I did all kinds of things from interiors, from sets for theatre and films, from um, designing clothes, uh, doing hotels. Uh, in, in the insides of hotels and even designing Mrs. Gandhi's stationery. In the middle 70s, I got this extraordinary opportunity for a young urban designer to go to Kutch. This was for the Gujarat State Handicrafts Corporation, which was at that time quite new and which was led by two very dynamic people, Minalini Sarabhai and Mr. Bridge Basin, who had a very new way of looking at craft. And my job was to go and stay in Kutch. Uh, I was given a matador van and I was given a driver who was also my interpreter. And I had to travel from village to village and document the crafts and also help craftspeople develop their skill and their traditions into something for the contemporary urban market. So there was Kutch. It was an extraordinary place at that time, quite unknown. In fact, when I told my Delhi friends that I was going to live in Kutch, they said, where is that? Is that in Africa? And in this, this very dry, barren exterior were the most extraordinary crafts. And they were practiced by people who were herders, were agrarians, and were nomads very often but they all crafted in a huge variety of not just embroideries but block printing, bandhani, tie-dye, weaving, dari making, wood carving, lacquer turning, rogan, pottery, leather, copper bell, casting, all kinds of things. So this was for me a quite extraordinary experience because I was uh, I had lived some of my life as a diplomatic daughter abroad. I then went to this rather sort of English speaking, um, rather elitist boarding school in Dehradun. And then I'd always worked either in Delhi or Bombay. So for me, the whole experience of Kutch was quite extraordinary. I'd grown up in a home which had always had beautiful crafted things, but I knew very little about the people who made them. And when I went to Kutch, I was still in that mindset where, oh, there were such beautiful things that were being made. Why don't people make them now? And why has craft become so sort of rather tacky, rather commercial? 
And actually that whole experience of, I went for three months, I stayed for six months, that whole experience made me realize that really there's not much point trying to make beautiful things unless you can do something about the lives of people who make them. And there has to be an incentive, there has to be some motivation for them to listen to what you say. So when I came back, I had a completely different experience where I was a merchandiser, designer for the Khazana shop at the Taj. And that experience, which was so radically different, and there are many stories to tell about that, but I don't think we have time, uh, coupled with the Kutch experience, made me come to the realization that there needs to be an organization which links the rural craftsperson with the urban consumer without a commercial incentive. Eventually, it has to become sustainable and economically viable, but in the beginning, it does need hand-holding, and otherwise, you can't even, even someone like me, who was so committed to crafts, couldn't really get Kutch crafts into the Khazana shop because they wanted ready stock, they wanted a certain quality, they wanted it to come very often on consignment, things that craftspeople were just not equipped to do. I have to say at this point that Daskar was not my brainchild. There were six of us who were working in very different fields, uh, but who had a common anxiety about craftspeople and the craft sector, but yet were convinced that it had huge potential. And certainly, for me, having seen this range of unknown at that time, craft skills that was available in just one small district in India, it made me really wonder, something I still wonder, is that why in India we don't look at crafts as a gold mine and keep thinking of it as something rather sad and primitive, which we have to subsidize until the people are equipped to take on uh, other industrial jobs. So uh, we all started talking and we thought, what is it? And we certainly never thought that we were going to become a permanent organization or that we would still be at it 40 years later when sadly two of our founder members have passed away. And we certainly didn't think that we were going to be working all over India either. The idea was just that we all knew some craftspeople and we would work with them. Uh, there was a lady who was working with uh, income generation, ski livelihood schemes for women in slum areas. There was someone else who worked in the government and was very frustrated. There was someone else who was an activist in Rajasthan. And we said that, let's start with them and see what we can do. So there are 20 million craftspeople in India. And as I said, we had no intentions of working with all of them. And nor do we do now. We work with about a lakh. Uh, and these 20 million craftspeople do not include the families who often work in the craft or the ancillary industries that support them, like washing, dyeing, uh, marketing, etc. So here they are practicing hand skills, which are not available in any other country in the world. There's, I don't think there's any country in the world that has this range of crafts, skills, and motive traditions that we have. So here are some, just some quick snapshots, just to show you the sheer diversity and range of textures, surfaces, materials. And yet, why are they not in the mainstream? Why aren't these people valued? To, uh, in somebody, I think the gentleman from Sahapedia, showed us a picture of a Sambalpuri ikat weaver. To set the weft, uh, the warp for Sambalpuri, for any ikat sari, is as complex as any software programming. But yet, the weaver, handloom weaver, gets, has no social status, gets no credibility, while of course, today, software programming is something that any prospective mother-in-law would welcome into her house. So what were the issues? Dislocation, and it's surprising, this was 1981. Not that much has changed. 
dislocation from the new urban markets and consumers, lack of market knowledge and entrepreneurial skills, competition from the mechanized sector, credit for raw material and stock, and no voice in policy making. So this is really one of the main things that craftspeople have lost touch with urban consumers and lifestyles. Formerly, their patrons were either the local rajas or the local temple or themselves. Now all these three are no longer really the, the patrons for craft. And government has taken over and NGOs like Daskar have taken over. And neither really are qualified or have the buying power to, to fill that role that used to be there previously. So how does Daskar work? Usually some craftsperson walks into our office and says, I make X, Y, Z, find me a market. And of course, that isn't the, either the beginning or the end, because very often what they bring is not suitable for the market. Either the price is wrong, or the raw materials are wrong, or the product itself is not suitable. And uh, you have to then see how you can do it, because having a skill alone is not enough. You have to have also understand crafts. People are often very romantic about craft. And some of them, I mean, they are craft purists who say, oh, this is a tradition. You shouldn't fiddle with it. You shouldn't change it. I think this is frankly bullshit, because craft is, has never been static. It is a, something that has responded to lifestyle and community and society all through the centuries. Craftspeople today, embroiderers in Kutch, can actually tell you within five years when a piece of embroidery was done. Just by the way the motif changes, it could be a parrot, but the way the parrot is done, the color, the thread, the quality of the thread, everything has changed. And it changes in response to its consumers. The problem is that today the craftsperson is not in touch with the consumer. So there has to be an intermediary. And that intermediary, whether it is a government official in one of the crafts bandhas or crafts emporiums on Baba Kharak Singh Mark, or whether it is a group of nuns who are working with some tribals in Madhya Pradesh, don't necessarily know who this cu customer is, who the consumer is, what kind of lifestyle they lead, what kind of trend. So that is one area where organizations like Daskar or young designers can certainly help. So identifying the beneficiary community, the craft skill, its potential is the beginning. We try and visit as soon as a crafts group comes to ask for our help. We try to go and meet, the, visit them, see what they do, what is available locally. And sometimes something very traditional can be made into something contemporary without changing it too much. And this is an example, obviously, of the Rajasthani puppets. Today, puppet shows have been taken over by television. And it's rather sentimental to think that they should go on making puppets if there's no market. But there are many things that they can make. And here are some, there's some toys, some glove puppets. And one needs to work with the craftspeople, because as I said, there's so many, many millions of them that you can't handhold them forever, and nor should you. The idea is to make them sustainable and quickly teach them what you know, which is actually not that much, and let them get on with it. Help them test market your solutions, see whether it works for them, and then move on. So you need to work with the community, and you need to show them how to do these things. Very often, you know, it's something as small as that when you're doing a kurta, where should you put that little gusset, which makes, and you, I try to always show them what would happen if you did something else, why something works, why something doesn't. And I also try to use their own uh, things from their own homes as the beginning of my design inspiration. Uh, I actually don't particularly like the word design in the context of crafts because you're not really designing something new, you're just developing it. So 
I prefer to be called myself a product developer, that's, that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, than a designer, but using something that they wear, their own choli or their own skirt, as the beginning of whatever one is making. So in between, obviously, you have to upgrade their skills, you have to streamline their production systems, you have to source appropriate raw material. That sounds very obvious, but frankly, many, many things don't sell, not because the workmanship is not beautiful, but because they're using some cheap poplin where the color runs. And so if you can find them an effective substitute, you practically fit done your job. So then design and product development, how can it become a functional thing? Then training and costing, pricing, packaging. Uh, costing is always crucial because there are craftspeople who are so insecure that they will price their products ridiculously low without building in all the other costs that go into it. And there are others who think that, oh, everyone in the city has lots of money, so let's really raise the price. So you have to show them how to do it. So developing a new product out of an old skill is very important. And we have a lot of people uh, who help us with this, apart from our own in-house uh, team. And giving craftspeople the confidence to make things of scale that try to get out of this stereotype and this mindset. So how to use their own lives as inspiration, how to, you know, something as obvious as black and white, which we all understand incredibly stylish, but for craftspeople that was quite a mind-blowing thing that they should not use color in their thing. And initially, I remember in Kutch, craftswomen saying to each other that Laila Ben knows a lot about embroidery, but her color sense is terrible, you know. And, but recently when I went, one of the Rabaris had made a wedding outfit, uh, a choli for her daughter, which was all black and white, because they realized that actually it looks quite good. So, or doing, uh, or a Matani Pacheri painters, to tell them that they don't always have to have religious paintings. You can do a painting without a Devi in it. And so that opened up a wonderful series of landscape paintings done in the Matani Pacheri style, which we did for the Taj Resort. We did 150 paintings, each one more delicious than the other. So this is, I think, something that, you know, designers sometimes take themselves very seriously. So sometimes it's just a little thing that you can do. This gentleman is a patwa from Rajasthan and he uh, used to make these threaded necklaces. But then there was a fashion which some of you may remember where everyone wanted their hair braided. And this old gentleman quite liked the money that was coming in, but he hated to have to touch young girls. So uh, someone in the Daskar office invented this little wheel of cardboard which came between him and the girl so he could thread the hair through it and he didn't have to touch it. And frankly, that earned much more money than any of the jewelry that we designed for him. So we are lucky that we have somehow accidentally discovered the bazaar as a way of test marketing our products and also as a learning place for craftspeople for what works and what doesn't work because craftspeople must be part of whatever you do and they have to tell their own stories, they have their own voice, they have the, they, what they perceive as a problem is sometimes different from ours. So we found that not just workshops and trainings in the field, but bringing craftspeople to the city so that they interacted directly was very, very important. I think Ranthambore is one of the projects of Daska that most of you knew. It's one of the few places where there wasn't a craft existing. Normally we do work with existing crafts, but there we had to practically invent them. But it's, it was out of need, and I'm glad to say that it's a very successful and sustainable project. Um, out of the 750 crafts organizations that we worked with over the years, some of them small groups of village artisans, some NGOs, some trusts and women's organizations. 
I think all except two have become sustainable and self-supporting after a period of three years. And I think that that's very important because craft is an eco economic activity apart from a cultural and aesthetic one. And if you can't make them sustainable, then you haven't done your job well. This is a very interesting example of what the internet has done. For a long time, craftspeople were incredibly passive recipients of whatever information people chose to give them. And unfortunately, a lot of people who interacted with them were often just hoarding their own knowledge and telling craftspeople what they wanted from them, often using them just like a computer, that, you know, punching in a design and telling craftspeople, make this. The, the digital revolution has really changed all that. Today, everybody has a smartphone. Everyone is going online, they're going to Pinterest, they're going to Southpedia, they're going to, um, you know, Amazon and Google, and they're looking at what is going on in the world. And this is a young Ajrak block printer from Kutch who saw some paintings of Jackson Pollock and he was so blown by them that he did this whole range of saris in which he's kept his own traditional adjunct motives and things in the pallos and borders and in the middle he's got Jackson Pollock. Yes, a little bit about uh, this particular thing. These are the Lambanis in Karnataka with whom Daskar and I have been working for quite some years. And uh, I want to tell this story really because Somebody, an earlier speaker, thought, talked about ways of seeing. And I think it's very important that all of us who work and who have our feet in urban and rural also understand the way people there see and think. Uh, when I first went to Sandur and saw these wonderful women in their clothes and used that as a foundation for the home furnishings that we developed, I used to also say to them when they came into the kendra wearing sort of printed nylon saris that, oh, why have you given up your beautiful clothes? They're so much nicer, they're so much more. And they used to laugh and they say yes. And then uh, a couple of years later we got, a, uh, we got an assignment to do some wall hangings for a museum in Sweden which was all about identity and women and home and uh, there were five groups of uh, Daskar craftswomen working on it and the Lambani group uh, we developed this piece and when we were doing the original sketches I asked them what this lady represented to them and why one side was a naked woman with her hair open and why the other half was in full costume and their response was that I know that our costumes are beautiful, that in some ways they tell our story, but they are a cage. When people see us in costume, we become Lambanis. And that has a flip side, people admire us, they take our pictures, but we are also not allowed to go into temples, we are very often thrown out of shops and restaurants because we are considered gypsies who are also thieves and lower caste. And so actually what we are is the woman on this side who is bare, who is free and who has all these power symbols all over and that is what we are as people. The costume is a costume. So obviously we have to create that awareness and we have to create an awareness of the importance of craft both ways. We have to make people in urban India understand that this is one of our great, great strengths at a time when India is still trying to catch up with the rest of the world in many things. This is uh, these extraordinary techniques, these extraordinary sort of um, people are a, a gold mine that we should be investing in. But we also need to create that awareness among young craftspeople who are leaving the sector very, very rapidly. About 
since demonetization actually there's 15 percent of the sector have left and I think there's there's a drain of about five percent every year now who are leaving it and we have to persuade them that there is a future and the future is not just economic the future has to be that class people have a social status that is something that we have not been able to do even those of us who value craft, who love beautiful things, who will buy them from craftspeople and put them in our houses. We don't appreciate the craftspeople and we don't consider them as equals. People sometimes, when I say this, get quite emotional and they say that's not true, you know, so and so craftsperson, whenever he comes to Delhi, I always visit him, I love him, you know, I know his daughter's names. And when I say that, when you buy a beautiful sari and you have a lunch party to celebrate it and invite your friends, do you invite the weaver? And then they stop and they think. And they say, actually, no. So that is the reason I think that craftspeople today are leaving the sector. Not because they're not earning well. Some of them now are earning quite good incomes but it's because they do not think of themselves as equals and society also does not include them as skilled professionals and they are skilled professionals. So I think I'll just leave all this now. So any questions?